Joining me now to talk more about the Tian, Tianzhou uh, One mission and China's space exploration is James Rice. He's a senior scientist at the Planetary Science Institute, and he's joining us from Phoenix. Um, you know, Zhang Chu, just going through all those different building blocks to get us to this point, as you look at all those achievements, uh, which ones do you see as the most crucial? Well, I think the uh, launch of the, this mission is going to be pretty critical for China's plans to build the space, you know, the space station uh, Tiangong 3. Uh, which they hope to have finished around 2020 time frame, because you're going to need to resupply the crew with consumables, you know, food, water, oxygen, um, and also this mission is going to transfer fuel. So this is a key milestone to be able to do this, because once you get a crew up there in a space station, you have to, you know, resupply them with the uh, necessary ingredients to keep them alive so they can do their work. So this, this is a, a critical test, and... Um, it's hard to say which one is more critical than the other when you start putting components together, but this is a major milestone they have to achieve because uh, it's going to uh, affect can you keep the crews up there. I think China originally um, eventually wants to keep the crews up for around six months at a time, and you're going to need several resupply uh, missions during that period of time. So as you say, this is a major milestone along this path. Um, what are some of the challenges you see in sending a space cargo ship? How, how does this differ from where we've been in the past? Well, and, you know, it differs because um, other missions, there are astronauts on board, which do the act of rendezvous and docking. And when you have, like, man in the loop, what they call it, you know, you can do much more, um, it's much more accurate. I mean, you're right there on the scene to do it. When it's automated or robotic, like this mission is, um, like the Soviet progress vehicles we've been, they've been flying over, excuse me, the Russian ve progress vehicles over the years, unmanned automated dockings. Uh, and then the U.S. has done that with the space station also. It, it allows you, extends your capabilities. You don't have to have a crew on board. You can launch, uh, which, which is full of supplies for the crew members already on, on, on orbit in the station. Um, so it is different because it's a completely automated procedure with the um, mission control centers down the ground and the automated computer systems on board the uh, individual vehicles doing this operations. Now you're talking about the automation, so can you explain the docking and refueling process? I mean, how complicated is this? Well, rendezvous and docking, or docking is, is complicated, it's orbital mechanics, and uh, it's something that uh, we've learned over the decades of, of the space age, and uh, early on it was pretty difficult to do. A lot of it is kind of counterintuitive the way you think, but uh, like I said, over the decades it's been perfected by the U.S., Russia, and, and, and China now, uh, and I think that uh, I, I really don't have any doubt they'll pull this off. I think that uh, the capabilities they've demonstrated in their previous missions are putting them to the point now they can do this, I think, pretty successfully. And I think it will be critical, because as the uh, previous reporter mentioned, this is going to dock with the space station um, three times over about a two-month period of time. And it's going to transfer fuel, which is something uh, the U.S. Ve uh, automated vehicles haven't done. Um, so that will help, you know, need the fuel on board to boost the station up periodi periodically in its orbit around the Earth. So that would be interesting to see the fuel transfer uh, operations. And then um, I think after the two-month period of the uh, three series of three dockings with the space, space station, uh, this is gonna, Tianzhou is going to go on a fly around three months on its own solo mission before re entering the Earth's atmosphere. Talk to us about uh, China's future space station. Obviously, this is a critical component, making sure that all of this works in order to put this in place by 2020. Well, it's interesting. It's been a busy uh, couple days here, and it's still April 19th where I am here in Arizona. Today, it just so happens to be this uh, anniversary of the launch of the very first space station by the former Soviet Union. It was called Salyut-1 back, way back in 1971. Interesting historical date. Um, I realize the launch is going to be tomorrow. But yesterday, NASA launched an automated vehicle up to the space station, carrying in supplies for the uh, astronauts on board the International Space Station. And then about five and a half hours from now, uh, the Russian Soyuz launch will carry one American, one Russian astronaut to the space station. Then, of course, the uh, Chinese launch, you know, to, to early tomorrow. So it's a busy day here, a series of days. But that's the age we live in, which is, uh, you know, for myself personally, growing up in the space age, it, it's really kind of exciting to see this stuff really happening, kind of bang, bang, bang. A lot's going on around the world. And uh, I think for China, you know, th their major goal right now is to get the space station uh, constructed and built and then operational. And, uh, you know, and then uh, this is only the second launch of the Long March 7 launch vehicle. The first one was last June. And that is going to be one of their workhorses. It's a, a medium class booster. 
And uh, then they're working on another one, uh, the Long March 5, which is going to fly an interesting mission in November going to the moon. This is supposed to be a robotic mission, but it's going to land on the moon and pick up some samples of the moon and bring them back to Earth. And that's going to be interesting because that hasn't been done uh, since the 70s with the Apollo program with astronauts, obviously, and the Soviets did it robotically in the 70s. So it'll be the first time that's been done in uh, a number of decades, and it should be pretty interesting. Yeah, I saw a big smile on your face. It's an exciting time for all of us who like uh, space exploration. James Rice joining us from Phoenix. Thanks so much.